Discover Wyoming. My name is Tom Folk, and today I'd like to talk to you about some of the research that I've been doing for the past few years. First, I want to give you a little background on history of agriculture and how we got to where we are today. Agriculture is really important for humanity. It's one of the building blocks of our culture. Its story informs us about who we are today, where we came from, and for our purposes, it's going to help direct our product approach. The first archaeological evidence for wild wheat is from about 23,000 years ago. People used grains for another 10,000 years after that, before there were the first signs of physiological domestication in these grains. And these came from an area what is now northern Iraq. Several reasons have been given for uh, why this shift to sedentary living, but we really don't know. It's all speculation that was so long ago. Most of them involve something to do with climate change. What we do know is that agriculture changed everything. Here's a map of the region of Mesopotamia, the Tigris-Euphrates River. That tan circle there is where the native grains originally came from and were domesticated. And we know that because they still exist there today. They still grow in the wild. Okay. Cereal crops were the very first domesticated plants. Emmer wheat, einkorn, and barley. Why would humans do this? Why would humans want to take the time to grow something like this? Well, again, it's all speculation because this was so long ago, but these grasses matured quickly, uh, fairly reliable in a drier climate. They stored well, and I think that's key, is storage, and they could be more easily transported. It's still an open question though about what came first, the uh, beer or bread, because there's evidence from as long as 14,000 years ago of ancient brewing. So these things are very linked together at a very early level, okay? Another point is that these grains could be fed to animals. Okay, this is important because for the, about the same time, sheep and a little bit later, cattle were domesticated. And what this all means is that farming became not just crops, but a farming system. Okay, the crops could be fed to the livestock uh, and the livestock could be used as a protein source. And this created more reliable food for people and allowed for the expansion of society beyond subsistence living. One of the earliest societies was in Sumeria in what is now Mesopotamia, and one of the earliest professions was agricultural management. Um, and this probably included uh, functions which became banking and accounting. And we know this because these cuneiform tablets, as you can see here, are actually sort of writing. Many of these uh, translated tablets actually talk about agricultural transaction, counting and accounting for uh, livestock and crops. Okay, about 3,000 years after that was the Egyptian economy gave rise, okay? And what that was um, in the Nile River Valley, farther to the west, you can see here a couple of examples of 3,000 year old bread. So the Egyptian economy was based on emmer wheat and barley. So agriculture gave rise to many of the social structures that we see today. Property ownership, towns, cities, military organization, writing, um, for good or bad, standing armies and military organization, metalworking, technology. This, these were the killer apps of the, of the time. So in short, agricultural fueled what is called the Neolithic Revolution. And this is the foundation of all of human culture and society today. If we fast forward about 10,000 years to the 19th century, by then there were multiple different types of crops, livestock, but before mechanization, a very early farmer would still recognize many of the processes that had happened 10,000 years earlier. It wasn't until the late 19th century when mechanization, advanced transportation, trains for one, steam tractors, uh, and harvesting machines that actually changed agriculture. Okay, this was process with the industrialization of agriculture. So today, 100 years later from that, more expensive machinery means that farmers must continually cut costs to stay profitable. Because we know that farming, farmers and, and agricultural production, these are what's called price takers, okay? Um, that means that they cannot control the price of their crops. They must take whatever price is offered in the market. So these lower yielding grains, which were called the hold grains, emmer, wheat, spelt, and einkorn, were dropped in favor of higher yielding, these free threshing varieties. So grains like emmer, wheat, and spelt, they didn't completely disappear. They're still grown today in Europe and parts of the Middle East, but for most part in the United States, after World War II, they're gone from commercial farming. And yet today, in the 21st century, wheat is still the most widely consumed staple crop in the world. And yet we've moved to this near monoculture of starchy, high yielding varieties. Now that's not bad for feeding the world, but I think there's room for variety here. 
Only since the 1990s has there been a resurgence in interest in these older varieties of crops, for their health benefits and their baking characteristics. And even now, 30 years later, markets for these grains are not well developed in the US. But times are changing. So what are first grains? So first grains is a term that we use to identify these less hybridized versions of these very early cereal crops. First grains is a subset of what are commonly called ancient grains. But if you've been out on the internet and you've Googled ancient grains, you're gonna get all sorts of information. It's very messy. And so what we wanted to do with this project is really define what we're talking about when we talk about these first grains. We're talking about the narrowing the definition to those first cereal crops that propelled the Neolithic revolution. These are those hulled grains, which means they do not thresh free of their hulls when they're harvested. There's a separate step required, a separate processing step, and that makes them more expensive to grow, and that means that's why they were dropped long ago, okay? So um, we're called, these are the emmer wheat, einkorn, and spelt, which is a close cousin of wheat, and these early varieties of barley and oats. So in our project, we're currently limiting our production to only emmer wheat and spelt, so we can focus on our supply chain, and make sure that we have a high quality product. We started this project focusing on specialty malt production for craft brew industry, as well as grains for artisanal bakers. However, there've been some processing issues that we're still working through with these very high protein grains. So high protein is good for bread, but it's not good for brewing, okay? So the high grain prices in 2021 20, have led us to focus on grain sales to try to capture more market share in this area. We still believe there is a market for malted spelt and emmer wheat and intend to revisit this area a little later, later when market conditions are more favorable. So what's this project about? So just a little context here, Wyoming has the least number of food processing firms of any state in the union. Okay, we have a very export driven market for our agricultural products. So not a lot of processing goes on in Wyoming. So this is a research and economic development project from the University of Wyoming to help develop our rural areas. So what we're trying to do is knit together these different disciplines and elements from these disciplines within the college to try to build this first grains niche industry in the state. Our ultimate goal is to build a stable, profitable, it's a key word, profitable business as a standalone company. In other words, what we're trying to do is build a public-private venture in Wyoming's ag sector that results in jobs, enhanced income opportunities for people in rural Wyoming. So profitability, jobs, and enhanced incomes are key outcomes of this project. What's different? How are we doing something different from what we've done in the past? Well, in the past, agricultural research has focused more on a single element. For example, bringing new crops or new methods of production or harvesting or analyzing processes that make them more efficient. But our approach is a more vertically integrated approach. And what we want to not only bring in these new crops, which are actually old crops, but foster their nascent markets by using our expertise across these multiple disciplines. We think that the same thing that happened in the craft brew industry in the 90s, where you went from a few very large beers down to the craft level with a lot of diversity, we think there's room for that in these niche markets with, with these crops. And then if produced at the right scale, can be profitable for farmers, okay? We call this applied supply chain research. Our study moves across these different phases to include vertical integration of production, processing, marketing to create this complete sequence. We're using a business incubator model approach with public-private partnership that sees UW cultivate this entity and to transfer it to the private sector. So to be clear, UW does not long-term want to be in this business, but we want to foster it so that it can stand alone on its own at some point in time. UW is taking the early lead with risk to build this niche where farmers alone would have difficulty doing this. There's a couple of key concepts I want to point out with this model. One of them is a branded product. We want to move beyond the commodity space. We want to have a premium quality branded product. We want to partner with growers. So we're not growing at all. We're actually learning or helping our, our grower partners to grow these crops. We have a profit motivation. We're trying to not be a booster for fad crops, but actually to unlock value and follow this market trend. We're starting small. We started with a demonstration in 2017. And when in 2018, we started with product development. And 2020, we started our first, had our first sales. And now we've had significant grain sales in 2021. 
Here's a picture of our first sale to the Bread Doctor in Torrington. So even during the pandemic, we were moving ahead with this project. Harnessing existing knowledge at UW. UW should be a player innovator in this area. We have the expertise to do this. Remember that these are commodities. So we need to have a differentiated product to sell above the commodity price. How are we gonna do that? Okay, we're gonna use geographic origin, that is Wyoming, and all the attributes that come along with that to sell this product in, this, in a market uh, environment. Different attributes such as our clean air, clean water, um, the, many of the, of the things that we associate with Wyoming, we can put into our marketing for these products. We're gonna use nutritional analysis. So instead of a bunch of fad marketing and internet hearsay, we're gonna actually have some science-based nutritional values that we can put out there as well. Okay? We're gonna ensure consistent quality in the product to build our brand. And we're gonna have an informational marketing campaign which tells a story, which links the product with the attributes, with the nutritional analysis to tell a complete story. Here's an example. This is a comparison of dietary fiber content across flour products. And this is just, I just grabbed these off of the grocery store shelf and wrote down their dietary uh, fiber content. And you can see that spelt flour is one of the higher protein contents or uh, fiber contents there. It's also high protein as well, by the way. In this vertically integrated project, there's room for innovation at every level. So at the growing level, we've got our knowledgeable farm crews that can help us learn how to best grow these crops. We're looking at product development, whether it's artisanal grains or malt. We can work with our partners to see what works best. We have processing and distribution, which we're learning to do right this time. Because remember, Wyoming is far from many of our markets. We have market research that we can do to find out what consumers want. And we're developing this whole integrated process to guide production as a pathway to privatization. And this is a model that can be replicated by other rural entrepreneurs and economic developers. Here's just an example. I'm not gonna go through this. This is our production matrix which shows how we're following this uh, system through from the original growing to marketing and um, uh, privatization. Uh, here's an example, this is our brand. This is a brand that developed a few years ago. This is a Neolithic brand is the name of our brand. It's a trademark brand. So we wanna have a distinctive brand that shows our product as something different from anything else that's out there in the market. We also have a couple of distinctive marketing themes. We have two trademark logos or slogans, a one step away from wild, which talks about our, the way that uh, these grains were originally just the first grains that were domesticated, as well as um, the sort of theme of Wyoming and outdoors and wild. And a lot of the different, there's some multiple different themes that work here. And then lately, have you felt like you need a little spell? Uh, that's just cute. <laughs> and then we have our, our Neolithic brand website. Uh, these are UW's only other trademarks besides the bucking horse. So we think there's a lot of value here. Here's a final cleaning of our product and our product. The, on the left there is the, is the grain going across its final cleaning. And then these are the totes of grain as they're ready to be shipped. So in 2022, we've reached an inflection point. We've demonstrated our ability to grow, process, and market the grain products. We've also reach our production capacity from a research standpoint. If we continue, then we need to grow beyond this nonprofit constraints of the university setting and into the for-profit private sector sphere. The next steps will be to develop the structure of this business and to seek outside capital to fund it so we can grow. And the university's role in this, this is what we're working on now, still be, to be determined. So here's a picture from our Powell Research Station looking towards Yellowstone National Park. So again, that whole idea of having a, the, the area of location, the geographic origin, is gonna help us market these products. If you'd like more information, visit our website at neolithicbrand.com. Thanks for watching.